Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Jolly. I'm a practicing attorney in Los Angeles, California, and I also serve as a fellow for the Civil Justice Research Initiative of UC Berkeley School of Law. As everyone is getting settled, I wanted to let you all know about other programs currently being offered here at UC Berkeley. Berkeley Law Executive Education, which oversees these Berkeley Boost webinars, offers a range of professional development programs for attorneys, business people, and those working for government and nonprofits, and they have some upcoming programs that may be of interest. The first is called Leadership in the Legal Profession. This is a business school style virtual course for attorneys who want to advance their leadership, people, and project management skills. And if you apply today, there are certain discounts that you can benefit from. In addition, there are a host of executive summer courses being offered uh, this summer. Uh, they run from mid-May to mid-August, and through that you can take single courses or earn a certificate during the summer semester. You can learn more about Berkeley Law Executive Education programs and the courses offered on their website, executive.law.berkeley.edu. Today and right now, though, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this ninth episode in our series of Berkeley Boost webinars, sponsored by the Civil Justice Research Initiative. The CGRI is an academic initiative that explores through interdisciplinary university-based research how the civil justice system can be made more available to everyone seeking relief. You can learn more about the work of the CGRI, including its diverse research publications and public programming by visiting our website at civiljusticeinitiative.org. The goal of these webinars is to explore important issues currently facing access to justice. And with each episode, we aim to offer perspectives from legal practitioners, scholars, and jurists. And today we are excited in that we are adding to our, our collection of speakers, those who have actually been impacted uh, uh, by COVID-19. Um, we're very, very excited about this. Uh, and, and importantly, we invite audience participation. So please feel free to submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom, and we will address them in our conversation. Today's episode focuses on insurance issues facing small businesses as a, response of, as a, as a result of COVID-19 and in response to it. Uh, uh, this month's episode is unique, as I said, in that we have three guests, not two, and two of our guests are business owners who have engaged in litigation against their insurance carriers who have refused to pay business interruption claims during COVID-19. Summer, Ger Summer Gerbing and Lonnie Torres are co-owners of the Ivy Room in Albany, California. The Ivy Room is a historic venue that was founded in the 1940s and about 10 years ago, Summer and Ivy decided to refurbish the venue. They turned it into East Bay's, uh, uh, one of the East Bay's premier locations for local and touring bands. And this includes surprise gigs for major acts like Jawbreaker, Meat Puppets and members of Green Day. Uh, in addition to being co-owner, Summer Gerbing is the beverage director of the Ivy Room. She has worked at reputable venues, including the Warfield, the Regency Ballroom, and Fox Theater in Oakland, California. And Lanny Torres, again, in addition to being a co-owner, serves as the talent buyer of the Ivy Room. She began her music career tending bar at CBGB's and uh, the Bowery Ballroom in New York. Uh, Lonnie currently manages the bar at the well-known music venue, The Independent, in San Francisco, California. We are also lucky to have with us Andre Mura, who is a partner at Gibbs Law Group in Oakland, California, and he also serves on the board of the CJRI. He represents plaintiffs in class action and complex litigation concerning consumers and workers' rights and product, uh, products liability uh, and drugs and medical devices. Uh, he's representing the Ivy Room and other small businesses and suing insurance carriers for denial of their business interruption claims. So uh, a Summer, uh, uh, Andre and Lonnie, Thank you so much for, for being here today. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank you for having us. So to sort of kick us off, Summer and Lonnie, I was wondering if you could tell us, it's been a year since, since COVID-19 really took hold and, and, and we started seeing lockdowns and other responses. How did you, and, and specifically uh, the Ivy Room, respond at the time and, and see this developing? Wow. Um... So, um, yeah, it was a whirlwind, I'll tell you that. Um, it was, what, uh, mid, um, I think a year uh, tomorrow, um, uh, in mid-March, we closed down super quickly, one of the first uh, to close. Um, and um, from there, uh, you know, we, we, of course, you know, made sure that our employees were okay and, and you know, started the communication. We quickly, um, you know, started a GoFundMe for them, um, and then, you know, here we are. We quickly uh, reached out to, uh, and filed a claim um, with our our insurance um, company. Um, you know, we felt that 
at that point, you know, we were shelter in place by local um, state government, and we felt that it was uh, essential to, you know, uh, uh, you know, file a claim with them and um, for for you know the money that we had been paying monthly um, for this claim. Um, sometimes we would choose to pay our insurance company before we even paid us for the work we did at the club. So, you know, we, we moved pretty quickly and filed that claim. So it was on the 13th, uh, March 13th, 2020, that is that that's when the lockdowns went into place and you could not, that it didn't matter if the band wanted to play or people wanted to come see them. You couldn't put on any more shows after that date. Is that, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We lost our first shows uh, March 1st. Um, people, you know, were starting to hear about the news, um, but it was official on the, on the 13th. Yeah. And so I'd imagine there was a lot of people, I mean, all of us can think back to, to the, the, the craziness of a year ago, but so you were dealing not just with uh, government lockdown, lockdowns being put into place. I imagine the, the bands were contacting you, audiences were contacting you, uh, looking for refunds or, or, or something of the like. Um, and then you were also working with your, your insurance carriers, and this was all taking place very quickly, I'm imagining. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, you know, dealing with our staff and not sure if they had work, uh, our, la our landlords, and, you know, just trying to see, you know, as, as the weeks kind of grew on, we, you know, trying to see what, it ne what we needed to do to kind of stay, you know, closed. Um, which costs money every every month to to be closed. So we kind of just tried to figure out how what's the best way we can kind of put the ivy room to sleep um, with not knowing when we're going to be you know able to reopen again. That was um, there were a lot of balls in the air trying to figure out what was what was happening, what was the reality, how long was this going to last, you know. Um, so yeah, that that was a really hard time, <laughs> definitely. And it was it was part of it was the unknown, you know, not knowing and watching a full years worth of calendar just kind of you know all, all that work putting it you know getting these shows um and then having them slowly and actually quickly really um get canceled and and realizing that all of 2020 was going to be right done so, yeah. so within yeah. that whirlwind that we did have luckily we have um started um we became a member of Neva, which it was a huge, huge helpful um, resource uh, to us and many other independently owned music venues around the nation. Um, they, you know, quickly got together and formed, I think it's now 2,400 um, music venues. Um, Whoa. Independently owned. Independently um, owned. Yeah. yeah, so um, that and, and gathering all of our resources, hiring lobbyists, you know, to fight for, you know, we're, we're, we got hit pretty hard, you know, um, uh, and um, so that that was a, a, a huge um, um, benefit for, for us and, and many other independently owned. Small so in addition to setting these uh, uh, sort of independent organizations to, to try to address this, you had another solution. You, you've been paying for it every month. You had this insurance that, that you had for, for business interruption. So it's, it's critical that, that you be banding together and, and creating these uh, 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 sort of safety nets for one another, but you've been paying for that very safety net. So you said that just a moment ago that you very quickly realized you have this business interruption insurance that you've been paying for every month. And so you, I, I guess you filed a claim. Is that, is that what you did first? We did. Yeah, we did that. With... Go ahead. Go ahead, someone. Yeah, we did that in the first few days. You know, it was like it was the top of the list. Let's let's file a claim. Let's figure out what this what the solution is for this. Um, you know, for no with, through no fault of our own, we had to close. So we thought, okay, well, this is business interruption insurance. Let's let's figure this out. Um, and they they quickly gave us uh, a denial letter, um, and um, and then we um, hired lawyers to try to figure out what, what we could do, what was, what, what, what we could do to try to figure this situation out. Because I think um, across the country there, all, all these venues were uh, doing the same, you know, um, we, we still are not able to open today. So definitely COVID did a number on, on our industry. And, and that, that, brings, that brings Andre into the, that brings Andre into the picture. Yeah. I was going to say many, uh, that was fairly common of uh, many businesses which had experienced uh, closures and then 
had business interruption coverage, which is you know, not an uncommon feature of commercial property insurance, and it generally covers all risks of loss. So it doesn't sort of specify the categories of loss, um, but it, it's pretty comprehensive uh, coverage that provides all risks of uh, loss or damage um, subject to certain exclusions. And so uh, many businesses had reached out to their brokers, to their insurance companies to file claims. Um, they pretty uniformly received denial letters and were very surprised. And then uh, litigation ensued fairly quickly um, involving all sorts of insurance claims, uh, claiming losses due to the pandemic, due to the potential for virus on the property, and also due to the related government orders that were suspending or severely curtailing uh, non-essential businesses across the country. And so because insurance is really in our country a feature of a creature of state law, um, this litigation was happening nationally, but it was it was really happening um, in, in various courts on theories about, you know, is California, is another state going to provide insurance coverage uh, for these losses? So the focus has really been, so there may be different answers across different states, but, um, but generally speaking, a, a lot of businesses, including, uh, you know, concert venues that were particularly affected uh, by the government closure orders in this situation, um, went and, 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 and sought relief in court. Um, and, and this is sort of very time sensitive because I think there was a Yelp review just to provide some color. Um, there was a Yelp report in September of 2020 that 60% of businesses listed on Yelp in the, in the Bay Area had closed during the pandemic and would, sh wow. would shut down permanently. So for many businesses who are on the brink, um, the ability to get that coverage, that insurance coverage quickly uh, was important. So many businesses turned to the courts to seek uh, access to justice on these issues. Was the basis of the denial the idea that infectious diseases weren't covered or that government imposed shutdowns aren't covered? Or am I, am I way off? Is it something else? No, the, the, the denials are just general sort of, uh, they, they seem pretty boilerplate when you looked at the denials. They, they weren't really sort of grappling um, with the particular circumstances, but they generally said, um, coverage for losses attributable to government closure orders aren't covered by your policy. Um, if there were coverage or, or losses attributed to uh, the virus, uh, some of the some of the insurance policies have uh, exclusions or carve out for losses due to the virus. So the insurance companies were taking the position that that coverage would have been excluded, and they were raising other bases uh, to deny. Uh, coverage generally. So, um, but they, they all had their theories. Um, and I think the, the business owners saw things quite differently when they read their policies. And so a lot of that is, is sort of the legal fight that's happening in the courts. And generally, I would say that the insurance companies have prevailed more often than the businesses, but there's been slowly sort of, uh, the, I think the businesses in the more recent uh, rulings from the courts have done a, li a little more favorably. And so we're now at the stage where we've heard from quite a few trial courts, but we really haven't heard from the appellate courts on this issue. So now we're going to start hearing, I think, in this next wave from state and federal appellate courts about uh, whether there is coverage under these policies. Can, can you speak to, um, and, and maybe uh, uh, Summer and Lonnie can, can chime in here as well, what is the theory here that you're uh, appealing, and does it have to do with the plain language of the contract? And that, that would be the question that would go to Summer and Lonnie, that, that your understanding of this would obviously be, if my business is interrupted as a result of these types of uh, uh, occurrences, we don't go out of business, you pay me. Is that, is that sort of this grappling here that we're saying? I think the grappling, the grappling is based on sort of the plain language of the policy. The policies provide coverage for uh, direct physical loss or damage. And so just to state it very simply, the insurance companies have been saying that um, if you're claiming a loss due to government closure orders, then we don't see any physical damage to the property. When the orders are lifted, you will be able to use your property again. So we don't view your property as having been damaged in the way that it might be damaged, say, if there's a storm uh, or there's a flood or a fire. And what the businesses have been saying is, well, the, the language says loss or damage to property. And I have certainly lost the use of my property. I cannot use my property for the business income generating function 
Um, and I had business interruption insurance, which is uh, exactly for that type of loss. It provides loss for loss of business income uh, that's attributable uh, to situations like this. So, um, so that's a, a lot of the fight is about the plain language. Um, the courts that have viewed the issue favorably for us, for businesses have said that these policies provide essentially uh, for a loss or damage. So those two words have to mean different things. Uh, you can't just require uh, damage. Loss has to be uh, given its own meaning. Um, and so they look to generally uh, dictionary definitions. Often these terms are not defined in the, in the contracts. So you just give them sort of the ordinary meaning that a reasonable uh, consumer would give them. And so um, there are all sorts of rules, interpretive rules for how uh, courts are supposed to read insurance policies, but generally they favor uh, the policyholders because um, these are products that are written by the insurance companies um, and they're provided sort of uh, to uh, businesses without much, uh, without much negotiation. Um, so generally, if there's a reasonable interpretation of the contract that would provide coverage, uh, courts are supposed to enforce that provision to provide coverage. And if there are carve outs, um, courts are supposed to read those narrowly. And if there's ambiguity, then courts are supposed to side uh, with the party that didn't write the contract, which is uh, the small businesses in this circumstance. So there are lots of interpretive rules for why uh, you might find coverage here. Um, and I think the fact that the courts are, are divided, I think, shows that reasonable re that there are reasonable interpretations of the policy at a, at a minimum um, that would afford coverage. And under, under most state rules of insurance contract, if that's the case, then you, you really should provide coverage uh, for these types of losses. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that um, one thing that perhaps there's this, how do I want to put this? There are a lot of these lawsuits. Is that not accurate? Uh, we, we must see a lot of businesses who are saying insurance company pay me. And these insurance companies, uh, I mean, I believe they're required by law to be able to be prepared for these types of things. There's all sorts of uh, 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 mechanisms to ensure that they can pay out under these circumstances. But um, uh, forgive me, but they're they're fighting like hell. Is that is that fair to say? To not if they if they start paying the Ivy Room and they start paying all these others, there there could be um, it's going to be very expensive. Is that right? I think generally the insurance companies have all taken the same position, um, which is that there just is not coverage, and they have taken that position regardless of the sort of nuances of the of the policies. So whether the policies have virus exclusions and for policies that do not have virus exclusions, the, the insurance companies have generally said, we are not providing any coverage under these circumstances. Um, and there's been some, some movement, I think, even in state legislatures to perhaps provide some guidance about um, wh whether there should be coverage here. Um, so there's sort of a fight in the legislative fear. Um, there's movements that uh, Summer Lani were talking about uh, to lobby Congress and other uh, other you know state governments to provide uh, coverage or other other bases for relief, um, and there's certainly lots of litigation in the courts. Um, some of that or litigation is now being organized. I mean, the courts, as you know, Richard, have various procedural vehicles to put together like cases so that they can be managed uh, efficiently. Um, that's been particularly important given. Uh, the effect that you know COVID has had on the courts as well. It's been it's been um, challenging for courts as well to to continue um, providing access. Well, that, to that's justice, that's so. something I want to that's something I want to bring up. Um, this idea of like cases being treated alike. There there are differences among these policies. There are also differences among these businesses. Uh, a, a, a music venue like the Ivy Room is different than a than a restaurant or is different than a, a, a other store or public place that can't open up during this time. Um, uh, Summer and Lenny, have you guys seen that in, in the way that your business has been has been treated either legislatively through through uh, the way you've been lobbying or um, perhaps in I guess this is maybe more for Andre in the litigation itself that there are there are differences um, here. Um, just uh, one thing that comes to mind, you know, with that is uh, early on, you know, they, they, um, the PPP 
um, loan was uh, was supposed to be for small businesses. And I know it was helpful for a lot of businesses, but it, it, it was actually obsolete for us as a music venue. We couldn't, we weren't, weren't able to be open. So um, a part of that loan was um, the money had to be spent on staff. So we didn't quite, you know, we weren't able to quite utilize that, that option. Um, so um, nothing, you know, we haven't been able to really utilize any kind of help federally. Um, California hasn't helped. Um, it's been hard for music music venues um, versus a, a restaurant that might be able to do to go and hire staff and whatnot. So yeah, we've had a hard time um, figuring out how we can get help. Um, we're, we're definitely a one of a kind um, business when it comes to you know having to deal with COVID. Um, it hasn't been easy for us, and we're still trying to fight right now through Neva. Um, there was a law you know recently passed, which is the Save Our Stages, the SBOG grant um, that was passed uh, when Trump was still president and we we still haven't had that relief come you know we haven't been able to apply for it yet so um, I hope that answers your question but yeah we we've had an uphill battle as a venue definitely yeah I would say on the on the litigation from Richard there there are certainly sort of different theories that that uh, different businesses have focused on. I mean, some have really focused on um, closure due to contamination on the property. Um, some have focused on government shutdown orders. Um, and, but, but I do think, you know, and the businesses obviously have been impacted differently. Different states have different closure orders for different periods of time with different restrictions. Um, so there, there, is, there are differences, um, but on the sort of larger, uh, questions of coverage, I think they are generally the same and the courts have been able to sort of try to decide those in ways that provide answers uh, to many different businesses. And some of the cases have been filed uh, as class actions. Some of them have been uh, grouped together. There is um, all the cases against a particular society, which is one of the insurers involved, um, have sort of been grouped together um, in a federal district court in Illinois. Um, so those cases are proceeding. Uh, farmers insurance is here in, in California. Um, and uh, many state court cases there have, have recently been consolidated and have been sent to Los Angeles. So they'll be handled by one mm -hmm. judge. Um, and so, and, and other, ca other, other cases are sort of proceeding individually. Um, who, but ultimately, who, they, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, who's seeking? Is is there an interest from the insurance companies also to have these sort of have global peace like this, or would they rather deal with this piecemeal? There's got to be, if this is a pretty standard, if, if business interruption is a pretty standard aspect of of these commercial contracts, there's thousands and thousands of these lawsuits um, either pending or or will be will be coming up. Um, who, who's looking for for this piece? Uh, that's right. I, to date, the insurance companies have generally not wanted the cases aggregated, which is surprising. Mostly um, for their own benefits, they, they, they want some sort of grouping because it just streamlines their ability um, to handle the cases from the defense side. But in these circumstances, they have not wanted that. Um, they have resisted sort of pulling together cases involving different insur insurers. Um, but there has been some grouping, as I said, in, in state courts um, and in one federal court that I'm aware of. So, um, you know, whether there's efficiencies to that grouping or not, I think um, there are cases heading up on appeal now, as I mentioned. And because insurance is really a creature of state law, ultimately the, the final decision about what, a, what an insurance policy means in a particular state is gonna be up to that state Supreme Court. Um, and so the federal courts are going to have to follow uh, that ultimate state Supreme Court decision. And in, in some of the cases now proceeding before uh, United States Courts of Appeal for the Ninth Circuit, uh, which is which is here, um, the, the litigants have asked the federal court of appeals to certify the question uh, to the California Supreme Court. And I expect uh, other other appeals will ask for that relief as well to sort of uh, get get an answer faster because businesses, as, as we talked about, um, are really struggling and really want a, a, some some answer to this question about whether there is coverage. 
Some are money. So this is ongoing. There, there's appeals. There are, there's more lawsuits. Questions might be certified at the California Supreme Court. This is, this is, this is not likely to be wrapped up very soon. And yet you guys want to be able to open up. You guys want to be able to put on shows. What does the future look like for the Ivy Room and for, for you guys? Um, that's a good question. We, um, we're doing everything we can to help save this, this small business. Um, we are very, very lucky that we received, um, you know, we got no help from local, state, or federal. Um, uh, however, luckily, um, we did receive a hardly strictly bluegrass music fund grant, um, which was, has been absolutely amazing. Also, the community um, uh, has really, really um, helped us through this by, you know, um, donating to a GoFundMe. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the community. Um, and so with that, um, you know, we, we, we are putting on uh, virtual shows coming up, a concert series, um, which is going to be amazing. And we're really excited about that. We'll be doing, um, you know, some hopefully um, uh, some outdoor concerts, um, a couple of those. Um, but, um, you know, we're, 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 we're hibernating um, and um, just trying to stay hopeful with uh, the Save Our Stages SVOG um, grant. Um, we are, um, yeah, just, just, just waiting for that day till we can get those doors open safely and get our employees back to work and get, you know, our safe, um, uh, all-inclusive, beautiful little club open again for, you know, the community. Are you guys having, um... There, there are a lot of artists out there that are also looking forward to, to getting back. I mean, they've been impacted heavily as well. Are, are, are you, have you been reaching out saying, hey, you know, this summer I wanna, I wanna play a show. Is that, is that happening? Uh, Lani, you're on mute. Uh, sorry about that. We do have uh, ongoing conversations with artists. Um, we have shows that are um, held for, you know, fall and winter. And if that doesn't work out, those shows will be, you know, they have backup dates in spring. So um, depending on how safe it feels, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be open as early as, as fall, I, I, I hope. Um, but we're, we're, we're waiting and we have great relationships with all of our artists. We have, you know, from local bands to big bands on our calendar, just waiting. I mean, this is, you know, this is the way they're able to communicate and have relationships with their fans. Um, so yeah, the artists have taken a big hit and we, we've all worked together to try to, you know, be ready for when, when that time is right. So yeah, we're, we're ready. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. That's, that's, I, 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 I so hope that, that, I mean, we're all hoping that this wraps up, but there are so many people that have been impacted over this past year. Uh, it, it's hard to believe that it's been nearly a year to the date, uh, that, that we've all started going through this and, um, we're also hopeful that that community spaces like the Ivy Room can can open up and can begin providing that uh, a service to the community again. And and, and I'm I, I know I speak that that I'm hopeful that that your insurance companies uh, uh, start reading the contract in a way that that makes sense uh, for all of the people who have been paying those monthly those monthly premiums. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time though, and and so I just really want to thank the three of you. Um, Summer and, and Lonnie for, for sharing your story and, and for bringing this to the forefront of, of our discussion. And Andre for, for providing that, that helpful analysis of, of sort of what's happening in the courts and, and where we stand right now. This is gonna be uh, uh, going on for a few more months too on the litigation front, maybe longer than that. So um, uh, uh, hopefully we start hearing news out of, out of that as, as well. Um, in addition to thanking the three of you, I wanna thank the executive director of the CJRI, uh, Ann Bloom, for organizing this event and the people of the uh, Berkeley Law Executive Education Program who helped make today's discussion possible. Uh, finally, before we sign off, I wanted to let you know that uh, the CJRI will be continuing these uh, uh, programs um, and our next program will be on April 16th and we'll focus on debt collection during the pandemic. Um, and, and our speakers for that event are uh, uh, Erica Rickard of the Pew Foundation and Miguel Soto of East Bay Community uh, Law Center. So again, just thank you, Summer, Lonnie, and Andre. This has uh, been so illuminating and, and so helpful. It was an honor. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much.